Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. In our weekend studies, we're going through the Epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had reached the area of verses 15 and 16 of chapter 3. Galatians 3, verses 15 and 16. You'll remember that Paul has gone to Jerusalem to point out to the church leaders there the gospel that he preaches among the Gentiles. They had no argument with that. They gave him the right hand of fellowship. They uh, clearly and soundly denounced the Judaizers. And the Holy Spirit and now has Paul speaking directly to the Galatian believers concerning the grace of God that was manifested in Jesus Christ. And we had that grand declaration in the 13th verse that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. The Pelagian influence in modern Christianity has led people to believe that they are justified or uh, redeemed on account of their faith rather than as a result of the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not being made a curse over and over again every time someone accepts grace. There was a one-time fulfillment in what Christ did and the promises that were made to Abraham. Do we come to verse 14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Jesus Christ? And the blessing of Abraham was that he was made righteous. It, it is so easy to grab a verse of Scripture and say, well, Abraham somehow decided to believe God and as a result of that, God made him righteous. And folks, that is the modern conclusion today without any serious Bible study. We have God saying to Abraham that he is Abraham's exceeding great reward. In Isaiah 51, he declares that he called Abraham alone, didn't call his fa anybody else in his family. Abraham didn't call him. God called Abraham. In Romans 8, we're told that those whom God foreknew he also did predestinate according to the promise of His will and those whom He did predestinate, He called. That's Abraham. And those whom He called, He justified. He made them righteous. God did that. All that He foreknew all that He foreknew, He predestinated. All whom He predestinated, He called. All whom He called, He made righteous. And all whom He made righteous, He glorified. That's what our text says. That was the finished work of Jesus Christ. So it's wrong to look at one verse of Scripture and say, Oh, you know, Abraham in his depraved state, a state which the Word of God declares cannot please God, cannot come to God, cannot be subject to the law of God. Somehow, he believed God and therefore he became righteous. People have said to me, 
Well, Steve, the Word of God shows me that God is sovereign. In fact, I, I'm of the opinion that if God be not sovereign, well, God is not God. Romans 8, the natural man, the man that's in the flesh, cannot please God. He's not subject to the law of God. and In fact, he cannot be. But, you know, despite the fact that all that's true, Steve, that, that all has one exception to it, and that's that a person who accepts Jesus Christ. And I don't see that exception. I do not believe that the depraved, natural man can come to God, can accept God, can believe God, can do anything for God. In fact, the Word clearly declares that he cannot please God. And so something has to happen in the case of, of that natural man in the flesh before he can believe and receive. And when Abraham believed God, he was shown to be righteous. Because had he not been righteous, well, he could not have believed. Modern theology seems to say that, well, we're, we're justified on account of faith. The Reformers declare that we are justified by means of faithfulness. And I, and I read to you some of Luther's writings where that the preaching of the free will of man is a heresy and dangerous to the Christian community. And yet that is what is popularly preached today. And I know many of you out there are getting tired of hearing about the same old thing every week after week from Steve, you know, but it's, it's woven throughout the Word. I heard some minister on the radio, somebody asked him, you know, if we have free will, if you, if you say to me, of course, Steve, everyone has free will, you simply haven't thought it through. In that terminology, even God doesn't have free will. There are many things that God can't do. The Holy Spirit goes on then and says in verse 15, I'm going to speak after the manner of men, even though it's a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuls nor adds to it, nor addeth thereto. The Lord says that He has given us the Spirit as the earnest, the down payment of our inheritance. And anyone who has walked with the Lord recognizes the leading of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Even though it's a man's covenant, they stick to it. You know, are you going to reduce God to something less than man, even though it's a man's covenant? If it's been confirmed, and that's a, that's a perfect passive, no man disannulleth nor addeth thereto. I'm reading from the King James. Now let's, let's be careful with the verse. The problem, one of the problems is the term covenant. The Greek word here means an agreement made by one. Okay? Normally to us a covenant or a contract is an agreement between two or, two or more two or more people, an agreement between two people based upon what two different parties will do, that is not this word. The better word today might be our word testament, but the perfect tense in the word confirmed says this is a testament that has been probated. This is done. This isn't something that we look forward to this text says that if this 
if it's if it's a man's testament and he allotted something to you and and it's been confirmed perfect tense it's done it's a finished transaction now you can't go back and say well you know the guy didn't mean that you know when in the testament he said he'd give you the mercedes you know he only meant the steering wheel I mean, you can't, you can't go back and modify that testament. And if a man won't do that, if a man won't do that, why would you charge God with doing it? Now, please don't miss the inference in the verse. The Holy Spirit is saying the Judaizers are charging God with being less righteous than man Okay, because God made a testament. I'm speaking after the manner of men. If it's a, a man's testament and it's been probated or confirmed, no man disannuls it. Says it's no man says it's not true, or no no man adds to it. Now I know, I realize that there are contested wills. I mean, they, they are contested on the way that the will is written or on the competency of the person who made it, made the will. You know, money changes people's minds a lot. But men normally stick to a testament. In most cases, they do. And if man does that, imagine God. You know, he's more righteous than man. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. Okay, that's an interesting verse. You know, seed's an interesting word. It's, you know, it's sort of like sheep, you know. You know, it's, you know, look, there's a whole bunch of sheeps out on that hill. I mean, you don't, you, normally you don't say sheeps. You don't normally say that. There are words which are collective words, but in the Hebrew and the Greek, these collective words have plural forms and singular forms. Now, they do in the, in the English language. By context, if you say, you know, look at that sheep, well, everybody knows you're talking, you know, singular. You know, or, or look at the sheep on the hill, you'd normally conclude that, well, they're, they're using the plural. The Hebrew word seed is never used of a human any place in the Bible in the plural form. Now, there's got to be a reason for that. In normal language, the word would be used both in the plural form and the singular form. Now, I agree for those of, you know, of you who are a little bit skilled in Hebrew, you know, maybe you know, a lot more than I am, and, and you do a computer uh, word search or something, and uh, you'll find seed in the plural, you will find seed in the plural. It is in uh, 1 Samuel, but it's referring to crop seed, not humans. Wherever the word is used, and you would think in the, const on, in the context it's used of a human being, it is always in the Hebrew, in the singular. And that's significant because you wouldn't expect it. But it becomes clear It's so clear that the rabbis thousands of years ago before Christ, I mean rabbis that lived before He did, they concluded that that unique use of the word seed only in the singular must refer to the Messiah. <clears throat> and yet, you know, apparently the Judaizers didn't see this here and multiplied millions of Christians haven't seen it. 
if God were saying to Abraham, to you and your seed, and by seed he meant all of his children, the normal way to say it would be to you and your children, or to you and your sons, or, or uh, to you and your progeny. There are all kinds of, of, of words that, that could be used in the Hebrew to indicate the descendants of Abraham. The simplest word would have been to you and your descendants, I will give this land. But God doesn't say that. Over and over again, He declares that He gave it to Abraham and to his seed. Now, I believe without any argument at all, the emphasis of the verse is on Jesus Christ. Do not miss the fact that the promise was made, the allotment was made to two people, Abraham and seed, singular. And the Holy Spirit says that the reason the collective word is always used in this singular construction is because He wasn't talking about Abraham's children. He was talking about Christ. Now to, now to the Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He didn't use it in the plural form. That's what our verse says. He wasn't talking about many. He used it in the singular form. And to thy seed, who is Christ singular. Okay? It, it, it's... It really is amazing the doctrine that, that God builds on the simplest constructions, grammatical constructions. He didn't speak concerning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as though they didn't exist. He spoke as though that they were presently in existence. And so in the way that he in the way that he phrased the word. The Lord Jesus Christ taught of resurrection from the dead and eternal life with Him. Here He uses the singular versus the plural to highlight the Lord Jesus Christ. God made an allotment to Abraham and to His seed. The allotment that He made, if we look at verse 18, the word inheritance, there is... is what is allotted by grace and God gave to Abraham to be the father, the blessing of many nations through His seed, singular, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What a, a marvelous promise that in Abraham all nations are going to be blessed And they're going to be blessed through His singular seed, Jesus Christ. And this I say, that the testament that is a covenant made by one with no conditions, covenant made with Abraham was, was an unconditional covenant. There wasn't anything Abraham could do or had to do. It wasn't anything Abraham could do to break it. And there wasn't anything Abraham could do to, to ensure it. It was a testament made by God that which He allotted by grace was an, e was an eternal land and kingdom and people to Abraham through His seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this I say, that the testament that was confirmed, again, perfect tense, perfect tense, perfect passive, which means it's a finished transaction. A finished transaction. You can say that, that in Abraham's day, Christ hadn't died yet. 
You know, in, in our calendar, he hadn't. But in the words of God, he died. He was crucified before the foundation of the world. In God's mind, he died for all whom God foreknew, predestinated, called, justified, glorified. Those are God's chosen people. That, that testament was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, several weeks back, we, we looked at the verse for seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith or by means of faith preach the gospel to Abraham. Now what we know is the scriptures, none of which was written in Abraham's day. Moses wasn't even born yet. So, you know, if you're a serious uh, person who... Uh, believes the Word of God, which are, makes you a rare individual these days, you know that the Word of God existed from the days of Adam on. And, you know, someone may well have, have copied some of the things that God taught. I don't know about that, but uh, God's Word was first. And even our eighth verse of the third chapter alludes to the same thing. Now, how do you teach someone who is absolutely opposed to the Word of God, wants nothing to do with it, you know, thinks it's a, you know, I don't know, a copy of, of documents that preceded it? How are you going to sit down and teach that person that this book and, and these words are only uh, writings of what God said years and years before? You can't, you can't separate the Scriptures from the Word of God. You can't do that. What God said to Abraham was Scripture. The fact that Moses may have written it down many, many, many years, I don't know how many years later, doesn't change the fact that it was God's Word and that it preceded Moses and the Jews by many hundreds of years. Many hundreds of years. Now we have a promise made to Abraham. The promise was made by God. It's recorded in God's Word. This is God's Word. It is eternal. That covenant has been confirmed before God in Christ. God before the foundation of the world declared that Jesus Christ would die in your place and in my place. God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, knew you before He created the heavens and the earth. He not only knew you, He preordained you. And when the time came, it was His timing, not yours. When the time came, He called you through His Word and He justified you in Christ. God Almighty did that not when... It was written down, but before the foundation of the world. This, this testament, this unconditional covenant, this promise made by one that is not conditioned on the other party and was confirmed by God in Christ. You know, the law which is 430 years after cannot disannul that it, that it should make the promise of no effect. Some think that's more than 430 years. I, I don't know about that, but... You know, the law wasn't 40, 430 years after the death of Christ, but here is a testament that was confirmed in Christ. You know, some, some have used this text to point out that, you know, God is timeless and that what we have... Uh, tried to make into uh, a calendar, you know, God declares to have been concurrent. This was confirmed in Christ. That's before the law that was added. 
that this testament was confirmed in Christ. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't matter that Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago. As far as God's promises and, and as far as His, uh, His contracts and are concerned, it was confirmed in Christ. Moses, desiring the reproaches of Christ more than the riches of Pharaoh's household. Now, he hadn't written anything yet. He was still kind of a, you know, a freckled-faced kid in Egypt when he desired the reproaches of Christ. Christ hadn't died yet, and yet that's the Word of God. When God made the promise... It's the same as fulfilled. Long after the death of Christ was determined in the councils of God, the law was added. We know that the law came a long time after the promise was made. And that promise included the certain fulfillment because God is God. There's no possibility, there's zero possibility that it wouldn't be confirmed. In fact, the, the perfect tense indicates that in God's mind, it was confirmed. It was confirmed with the present reality that it stood confirmed. Then the law which came afterwards couldn't, couldn't disannul it. it cannot disinherit, uh, cannot change it. It wasn't added to a testament that's already been confirmed. For if the inheritance be from the law, it is no more a promise. There's no, there is no compromise. You are not redeemed, folks, by, any, by something that you do and something God did. There is no synergism in your redemption. Now, there may be synergism in your fellowship and in your walk, you know, as, as far as it regards your concerns, your, your, your peace, your rest, your joy, but not in your redemption. Jesus Christ suffered alone. He didn't need you to help him with that. The same way in which you were made a sinner in Adam by no synergism, in the same way you were made righteous in Christ. That's what our text says. If the inheritance be of the law, it's not a promise. You can't mix the two. It cannot be partly a promise. You know, God did not say to Abraham, you know, here's what I promise, Abraham. If, if you do this, and if you do this or that or the other thing or whatever, that's not the covenant that He made with Abraham. There are groups of Christians who will argue vehemently that it was a conditional covenant, that Abraham had to do something. But folks, you can't make that argument stick. You can't make that argument from the Word of God. You have to make it from human logic. God put no requirements on Abraham. God simply said, this is my allotment. To Abraham. And the word gave there in your text in verse 18 is our Greek word charizomai. God gave it to Abraham by grace. It can't be by grace, folks, if Abraham did anything to deserve it. It would then be reward. It can't be by promise if it's by keeping the law. And it, and it cannot be by keeping the law if it is by promise. And the Holy Spirit has gone out of His way to make it crystal clear to the reader that there's no mixture between law and grace, between promise and law. God gave it graciously to Abraham by promise, not by works not by keeping the law. There, there wasn't any law given back then. It was entirely by grace.
you know, you can, uh, I don't know about where you live. I, here, you can drive down the street, you can see over and over again, you know, Grace Baptist, Grace Bible, Grace this, Grace that. Yet, yet very few of those churches really understand the grace of God. When we were His enemy, when we were not working for God, when we were not seeking God, when, when we wanted nothing to do with God, when we had turned everyone to our own way, God by grace laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. Not everyone, but us all. We had no part in that. We had no part in that redemption. Jesus Christ bore our sins in His body on the cross. I was in a discussion with someone who pointed out uh, you know, how Christianity demeans women. You know, there's very little said about wives beating up husbands, but you know, I've, I've, I've sure heard of both. What I read is, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, I would think it'd be wonderful to, to have a man who, who not only is willing to die for you, but who's willing to die for you when he knows full well that it was your fault, not his. And not only is he willing to die for you, knowing that it, it was your fault, not his, he doesn't blame you for it. He doesn't, and He doesn't pick on you. You know, and one of the things I say to, to older men that, that, that he's to look at his wife as Christ looks at the church, holy, unblameable, unreprovable, not having spot or wrinkle. You tell me, folks, what other religion teaches such a thing? Listen, Christianity never demeaned women. Sure, the woman's to be subject to her husband. The husband's to be subject to Christ. Is he demeaned because he's subject to Christ? Is she demeaned because she's to be subject to her husband? It's a natural order. It's a natural order that works. And God knew what He was doing. The inheritance is not of law. It is, it's a promise. The, the gorgeous truth, the marvelous truth, is we had nothing to do with it. You are not redeemed because you're good. You're not redeemed because you know, you're better than somebody else. You're not redeemed because you're prettier than somebody else or, or more handsome than somebody else or more smarter than someone else, or anything like that. That God would enjoy having you over someone else. None of those things, folks, are true. You were His enemy. You were not seeking Him. You weren't working for Him. You had turned to your own way. And in that condition, God laid on Christ the iniquity of us all, of us all, all of us, so that we stand before Him wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight, without spot, without blemish, by nothing that we did. And folks, that's not true of law. So if, if all this is true, why did God add the law? That's a good question. Dearly beloved, we need to study. Listen, it was, it was because of serious Bible study, what most Christians know as the Reformation, began. Let that sink in a minute. And those who had dedicated their lives to feast upon God's Word and to take God at His Word, realize that the theological system, the church system, had moved far away from biblical truth. And there was a tremendous resurgence of taking God at His Word. Believing 
that this was the infallible, inerrant Word of God, and it was a, a dramatic change in history. We're talking about a historical event here. A dramatic change in history and in the minds of people who came to realize that God was supremely sovereign and that we are made righteous by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men like Luther, even though the, 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 even though the Lutheran denomination is far from the teachings of Luther, wrote... You know, to even suggest that man has a free will is perilously dangerous for Christians. I want to tell you folks that to suggest today that man does not have a free will is perilously dangerous. What a change in 400 years. There was a tremendous change beginning with, with what I call the downfall of, of Princeton Theological Seminary. And it became very popular. In fact, it was, well, it was, it was the theme of, of places like Dallas Theological Seminary. You know, that, you know, yes, you are justified uh, by no work of your own, but... You are justified by the faith that you place in Jesus Christ. And sanctification is left up to you. Dearly beloved, I suggest to you that that is perilous handling of the Word of God. It is astounding that many of the, the leaders, you know, that modern Christianity considers to be the, the pillars, you know, the of our uh, faith or the stronghold of our theological understanding today would ever teach things like the Lordship of Christ. Folks, I don't want to pick on movements and I don't want to pick on other people. I don't want to pick on you. I, I, I don't want to pick on the, the, the anybody or anything really. I, I want you to look at the, the text. I want you to look at the Word of God to even suggest, listen carefully, to suggest that the old man can't possibly do anything to redeem himself, but he can sanctify himself, is as close to heresy as you can get. Are we suggesting that God made you righteous, but He didn't sanctify you when He made you righteous? And, that, and now that's all up to you? There are blessed few Christians who really believe that God is working in them both the will and to do of His good pleasure. That God is working in you according to His will and that you have received the greatness of His grace. Dearly beloved, it is... It is not grace if you had to believe to be justified, and it is not grace if you had to work to be sanctified. And I'm suggesting as seriously as I know how to do it that the bulk of modern Christianity minimizes the finished work of Jesus Christ and maximizes human responsibility. One of the great themes of modern Christianity is, well, if He's not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Baloney. He's Lord of all and He is Lord of all in your life. And you are where you are and what you are because of the will of God and because of the grace of God, and He is working in your life according to His good pleasure, the great result is not really you, but His glory and His will, which is, which is why we read in the closing verses of this third chapter, ye are all the sons of God by means of the faithfulness that resides 
in Christ Jesus. Look, I'm going to stop here. Ask for your prayers concerning the direction of this ministry. I hope all of this video finds you all well. Look, we love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your word, for your grace, for the Holy Spirit, your comforter. We just ask that you would seal to our hearts only that which is truth, filter out all the foolishness, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you, for it's in your name we pray. Amen.